Hello everybody, welcome to Monroe Live. My name is Tom Pruchet, I'm Director of Electrification for Monroe. And if you don't know who we are, we are a lean design consultancy where we specialize in new product development and we have a lot of focus on EV products and uh, costing, benchmarking, teardowns. Um, today we're gonna talk about batteries and uh, we're gonna get into the different types of batteries, the different styles and their configurations as they are uh, related to electric vehicle applications. So behind me, I have a table full of all kinds of good stuff to look at. I'll start with the basic form factors of batteries. Um, the ones that we see most popularly are of the cylindrical type. As you see here, they are called that because they're shaped like a cylinder. We have a couple of examples of pouch batteries that are very popular. And then we have the prismatic cell. That's an interesting sort of a combination of the two, if you will. So what do I mean by that? Um, if you get inside one of these things, you can tell that they're full of all kinds of unique features. Um, I will talk about the smaller cylindrical cell first here and an important feature of that cell just so you understand what we're talking about. So this is the anode, which is one of the two parts of the cell that are most important. And notice that it's got this little foil tab that comes off the end of it. So this is the part that attaches to the bottom of the cell down here. And it's also electrochemically the side of the battery that gets warmer, if you will. So it's a great place to take heat from. If uh, you look at the other side of the battery, you'd find that this is the cathode. So again, here's your positive terminal, here's your negative terminal, the anode's the negative. So this small tab, if you take a look at Ohm's law, you'll find that this is a uh, quite a restriction. And because it's a restriction, it has higher resistance than other components would have, and it, it becomes a hot spot because of Ohm's law. So talking about Ohm's law, take a look at it. If you're gonna be involved with vehicle electrification, understand Ohm's law. It's a critical part of it. It will keep you safe, and it will certainly ground your understanding in how it all works. So that said, <clears throat> take a look at a so-called tabless design. And this is what you find inside the 4680 cell. You'll find instead of one tiny little piece of foil at the bottom, you have several pieces of foil. Of foil. This goes around the circumference of it and gives you a much wider path for collection of the current. So you can see that the restriction isn't there with the tabless design like it is with the, the tab type design that we looked at earlier. So now what does that relate to out here? These all have tabs in them. So you have the small 18650 that's uh, very popular. It's the type that's used in model S's and X's. You have the uh, 2170 or 21700 as it's usually called. Uh, again, this is a function of the diameter being 18 millimeters here for the 18650 and it's 65 millimeters long, along with a 21 millimeter diameter and 70 millimeters of length. Uh, then you get up to the 4680, and this is 46 millimeters in diameter and 80 millimeters in length. And you'll notice that the bottom of this thing is quite a bit different than the bottoms of the others. These are flat. Um, these, again, have the real small tab, and this becomes kind of a hot spot. Whereas this one has the tabless design that connects around the perimeter, so it doesn't have that hot spot. The anode still gets hotter, but it's a different approach to cooling that we'll touch on in a moment here. But before we get too far, let's look at the prismatic. So the one thing about the can of the cylinder is that the expansion and tr uh, contraction that occurs during the charge and discharge cycle, as well as over the useful life of the battery, it tends to expand, is pretty well managed with the can. You don't see much in the design of the pack that is uh, relevant to the expansion and contraction of the cell because the can kind of minimizes the motion and manages it quite well. The pouch, not so much. This pouch will grow in width and it will contract. It grows when you charge it, it contracts when you discharge it. And um, you have to manage that in the design. You'll often find that there's uh, polyurethane foam that serves as sort of a compression spring to keep the, the big flat surface under pressure and managing the expansion and contraction. So the prismatic is kind of the best of both worlds. When you look inside here, you can see that, oh, okay, I've got a metal can on the outside, so I'm managing a little bit that expansion and contraction, uh, but it still 
grows enough where you do have to keep these under compression when you have an array of prismatic cells. Inside the prismatic cell, I find this interesting perhaps, so what do you have? You have what amounts to groupings of pouch cells without their envelope. So when you think about the prismatic cell, it is truly a combination of the cylindrical cell that has the metal can surrounding it and the pouch that uh, gives you a maximized um, efficiency with your space. I can fill this entire rectangular space with energy, whereas with the cylinder, no matter what I do when I put them together, there's always that little spot in the middle where you can't put anything. Sometimes that's used for cooling, sometimes that's used just as a place for fire retardant foam. Other times, as we'll see with these other batteries, it's just air inside there. So again, that can become part of the risk mitigation strategy for thermal runaway in the uh, cylindrical cell. What you do with that little triangular space between them can be important. So with uh, the, the pouches, they're a little bit more difficult to manage with regard to uh, thermal runaway risk mitigation. There's a lot of use of things like aerogels and other flame retardant materials that are used to try to keep these big blocks of energy self-contained in the event that one of them tries to let loose. We'll save what is the cause of thermal runaway for some other discussion. So then let's look at some of the different types of modules. So when you start with a cell, this is the fundamental building block, and what you end up with in the end there is an array of both series and parallel cells. So in other words, when they're in parallel, they're electrically tied together like this with the cathodes tied together and the anodes tied together. And as soon as they're electrically tied together, they behave very much like one cell. Not unlike the way this prismatic works with what amounts to four pouch cells uh, in parallel and still giving you the same sort of terminal voltage that you would expect with the smaller cell. So that being the case, the um, the cooling subject is a very important part of battery design. The parallel combination turns it into a big block of cells that acts as one, and you'll hear this in terminology in terms of S's and P's. What are the P? The P's, that's a parallel cell group. In the case of some batteries, this might be 22 cells or 40 some cells in parallel, depends on the application and how much power you need and what the size cell it is. Uh, and then there's the series configuration. How many do you put in series? This is a little bit like your D cells in a flashlight. If you have two, okay, I've got two one and a half volts in an alkaline situation for a total of three volts. These are much higher in voltage, nominally 3.6 volts. So, okay, I put two of these together and I get 7.2 volts. And if I keep putting them together in a series array, I get higher and higher levels of voltage. So that's basically what the module does. Normally, the majority of the pack designs that we see are cell to module, module to pack. So here's a module. This one's out of a lucid air. And it's an interesting topic because you can read a lot about this thing. If you go searching on YouTube, you'll find a lot of interesting information about this. But one of the things I wanted to quickly show is that underneath you have wires that are attaching the cells to these uh, bus bars that we call current collectors. So you'll notice if you look very closely that these tabs are both wide and small. And that is different than what you'll find in some of the other ones uh, that we'll show here in a minute that use bond wires. So here's an example of bond wires. These are small wires that interconnect the current collectors to the cells, and they do it with the same size wire. And that wire, in both of these cases, serves as sort of a fuse. Uh, in a lucid example, the smaller one becomes the fuse, and the other one is larger specifically so that it doesn't have the voltage drop because of the bottleneck that it represents as a, as a fused wire. So you'll notice that Tesla has moved away from the bond wire concept. They are a little bit frail. They can break away. They can cause malfunctions. Um, so you'll find the most recent uh, Tesla uh, modules, if you have a module, they'll have laser welded collectors instead. So a quick look at these two almost identical looking modules. These are from model S and X, uh, but two different evolutionary steps. You'll notice on this one that you've got two rows of cells with a, a big gap in between them, two more rows 
with uh, another gap. And in that gap, if you look very closely, you can see it at both ends, there is a coolant channel that runs down the middle and just picks up the tangent of all the cells. It's a straight piece of pipe. Quickly they learned though that they could gain more of the side space of the cell by making it a serpentine shape, shaped like a snake. And that's what you see with this module design. If you look closely here, all the rows are equi equidistant from one another. And what that means is that the coolant channel snakes through and picks up more of the surface area of the side of the cell. So this was an evolutionary step that improved the cooling for the Model S and X. So from there, I can take you to the latest versions of those modules. All right, so the Model 3 and the Model Y, if you look closely at them, there's not a lot of difference between them. They do have bond wires. Most of the, these have been removed, but again, the little small wires that interconnect the cells with the current collectors. Uh, if you dig through this plastic, you would find the bond wires are covered in this. And again, that was to address both, you know, the need to have that as an electrical insulator and the foam serves as sort of a vibration damper against those wires breaking loose. So the cooling system on these, if you look at them, this has a manifold on one end that represents, say, the inlet where the coolant comes in. And then on the far end, you have the outlet. So that means that you are in a cooling mode and you're bringing cold water in and the hot water comes out the other side after it's cooled the battery, creating a gradient that means that the inlet side has cells that are cooler than the outlet side does. So that's kind of problematic. The hotter cells that run that way most often will have a shorter useful life because of that. And you'll see that the three and the Y have the same basic arrangement, inlet on one end, outlet on the other. And they all have this sort of serpentine cooler that I was telling you about that we saw with the S and X module originally. Then came the plaid. So here's the plaid. And you notice that they did something unique here. The inlet and the outlet are on the same end of the module. So what that means is that the serpentine cooler has been split down the middle. The cold water goes in one side, goes all the way down to the end, returns and comes back to this end, creating a situation where every cell has both a cold water and hot water connection, creating a uniform temperature gradient across the array and a much longer useful life of all the cells in the array. So another big change occurred with the plaid evolution. Um, and again, you may find this in a lot of other places, but the bond wires are gone. Now suddenly the current collectors are laser welded directly to the cells and the frail bond wire is gone. And then they've created details in the current collectors that represent the fuses that the bond wires used to perform the function of. So then you get to the structural pack and it's kind of the last iteration from Tesla to show you. You'll see that they've done the same thing. The inlet and the outlet are on the same end. So it's the same sort of partition serpentine cooler. Um, much bigger because this is now the uh, 80 millimeter cell, so it's a, a, a wider connection. And because this 4680 structural pack um, has the tabless design, the side cooling, I think, makes it a clear winner. With the smaller cells, the 2170s from the 3 and the Y and the 18650s from the Model S and X, um, yeah, the, uh, um, the cooling function at the side becomes a subject of debate. And whether one is better than the other, I'll leave that for others to decide, unless we get to do an experiment one day to prove or disprove one way or the other. So that said, um, let's take a look at how it scales up. We had modules, we had small ones in the beginning, we had slightly larger ones. The voltage goes up with these larger modules as well. They could become inherently more dangerous. It is still a difficult thing to get shocked by them, but again, Ohm's Law will save you. If you know where to not touch, then you will be safe. Uh, so it's a matter of where are the voltage potentials. And yeah, this one could give you, um, you know, 80, 90 volts. Um, even in the discharge state, whereas the smaller modules are much safer to handle down in the 20 volt range. So that being the case, sometimes there's no module at all. That's what's happened in this structural pack here. They've gone away from the ability to be able to replace sections of the battery, uh, and now it's all one big disposable piece of hardware. So again, we call this 
cell to pack, whereas the usual structure we see is cell to module and module to pack. That said, let's look at some of the packs. So here's the model S and X. I'm not sure which one this one is. It doesn't really matter for this discussion. One unique thing about this design is the, the cooling system has these little check valves in them. These are normally pointed straight upwards. It makes it very easy to remove this pack from the car. It's basically just the perimeter fasteners and some other fasteners that hold it all in. And um, when you drop it, this coolant port disconnects itself and the little check valves keeps the coolant inside the battery pack, which is a nice thing. And you have the same sort of feature on the electrical connection side where all of these electrical connectors are pointed upward so that they just fall right out with the battery pack. Whereas a pack that's not designed for such an easy swap, you might have several things that have to be manually disconnected and the coolant will probably make a big mess for you because it won't have the little fancy integrated check valve as part of it. So S and X, three and Y. You can see the drastic difference in the module size. So that kind of takes me to some of the differences in how you manage these batteries. In other words, um, we hear the term battery management systems uh, or BMS as a term all the time, what does that really mean? So generally, it is what keeps the lithium ion battery array safe. And when I say array, I mean anytime you have uh, two or more cells in series, they are independent devices that will behave independently from one another, and they will drift apart from one another with regard to their state of charge over their time, over their useful life. So every charge-discharge cycle might make them grow further and further apart in state of charge. Ultimately, you would see this with voltage change. So the battery management system has a number of different responsibilities. First and foremost, it monitors those cell groups. So when we talk about cell groups, we talked about the series and we talked about the parallel of cells and wide arrays of parallel cells. I would call that collectively a cell group and that's kind of how we treat them here. So you have to monitor the voltage of that cell group and that's one of the primary functions of the battery management system. So in the case of this Tesla system here with the three and the Y, you can see that there is a device that's local to the module that gives you that function of being able to measure those voltages. If you look really close, you can see that they use, again, some more bond wires to connect each and every cell group to the battery management system so that you can measure the voltages in real time. Another purpose behind the battery management system is to measure temperatures. Uh, a third purpose is to measure, um, or more importantly, provide the balance function. In other words, I mentioned when they drift apart. I want to move energy if I can, and there's a type of balancing system called an active balancing system. We don't see it much in automotive, but it's very real elsewhere. But that would tend to move the energy from the one that has the most to the one that has the least. And that has lots of variants, so I won't go into that. But the passive systems that we normally see just simply take the ones that are highest in state of charge, and it puts a resistor across those to bleed that off so that those states of charge come down to that of the others. So the balancing function, the temperature measurement, the voltage monitoring, it's usually handled by a satellite device like you see here where we have four modules and four of these little satellites. There's also a battery management system that collectively brings this information together and has the intelligence, intelligence to know when to do balancing and uh, it also adds the functionality of contact or control, that is the electrical connection and disconnection of the battery pack to and from the vehicle. So yeah, there's your basic functions of a BMS. You'll find different configurations with regard to whether you have uh, the satellite configuration with a, a central unit that manages it, uh, primary and secondary is probably uh, a good set of terminologies for that. Um, there's also the concept of the spaghetti wire, meaning you can have a BMS that's all in one piece, but it's gonna have a lot of wires that go to all the cell groups. So here's an example of a battery management system that has the ability to do everything in one uh, position, if you will. So you're gonna go out and you're gonna measure all the cell group voltages. There's gonna be spaghetti wires all over the place in this pack. And you can take the same basic concept and you can bring it down to a more manageable level, uh, but it's quite normal that there would be a small plastic module, plastic covered module that would be the satellite system 
that minimizes those spaghetti wires. Those spaghetti wires are very important because in the case of the cell group monitoring, those are small wires. You don't want to use big wires for that, but if those wires ever touch together, there needs to be some sort of current limiting function in that or bad things are going to happen. So we find a lot of differences in different battery designs with regard to the current limit function on the cell monitoring wires. And by having the, the so-called primary and secondary design, you minimize how far those wires got to go and you minimize the risk of routing those wires. Again, you know, any sort of a malfunction that was from you know, shock vibration, normal wear and tear, or where she had a collision, yeah, those wires can come loose and they can cause a big problem if there isn't proper current limiting behind them. Cooling. We've seen a couple of examples of cooling. We've got the bottom cooling that Lucid uh, is very proud of. And if you look at this uh, module when it's torn apart, you'll find that there's a thermal interface material between the bottoms of the cells, which in this case are now pointed upwards. Um, it's a, a good cooling system design. You'll notice that the cooling plate has this design in it that's supposed to provide a uniform uh, distribution of coolant throughout the, the module, you, you end up with that same sort of temperature gradient that I was re referring to earlier, where the cold water coming in might cool some cells more so than others. Um, when you get into the pouches, there's a mixed bag of ways that those are cooled. Um, before touching on that, we'll talk about the prismatic, and what is most common is that there'll be a layer of thermal interface material along the bottom of the cell. Sometimes you'll see some cooling at the sides, but not very often in the case of prismatics. But you will see that with the pouches. So in the beginning, first pouch cells that I looked at were from the Chevy uh, Volt with a V, and they had these <clears throat> plates that went between every cell and picked up the entire surface area of the cell, and they even had little coolant channels that were distributed throughout the, uh, the plate that gave you a way to put actual coolant through there, liquid coolant. Later, the bolt with a B <clears throat> ended up with a metal plate there that was kind of L-shaped that would carry the heat off the surface of the, um, the pouch cell and down to the L-fold where there would be a, a cold plate at the very bottom to take the heat away. Later, we saw this happen that aluminum plate was too expensive. So we went from an aluminum plate that had cooling channels in it to one that didn't to no plate at all. And what they simply do in that case here is they use a, a thermally conductive adhesive at the very bottom of the cell and they use that to couple the, the thermals to the cold plate down below. So you can imagine that this saves a lot of money. Uh, and if it doesn't cause you a poor performance concern, then it is a very inexpensive way to do your cooling. So let's talk about the way pouch cells are cooled. So this is an example of the Ionic 5 battery module. And you'll notice that at the very bottom of the cell, much like what we were talking about with this cell here, there is a layer of thermal interface material. It's been removed, but you can see the edge of what it was before it was removed. And this is what it looks like when it's removed. You'll see that it kind of follows the topology of the surface area of the multiple cells that it's trying to cool. But you may also know a little bit about thermal interface materials. The basic idea there, you know, a high school kid who does a gaming knows that when he puts a big cooler on his CPU, you want metal to metal and the thermal interface material is supposed to fill the micro pores of the otherwise metal to metal contact, it was never supposed to be that thick. The thermal interface material, while thermal, thermally conductive, it still represents an impediment to transferring the heat. You want the stuff as thin as you can make it. So yeah, not so thin in this case. We find that allowed in, in the pouches. And again, these are large format cells that have lots of energy in them. And because of that, it's pretty easy to get large amounts of power out of them. And they can get away with thermal systems that are quite obviously challenged by things like thermal interface materials that are too thick. Then we talked about the space in between the cells. Oftentimes we find them taped together and makes them difficult to get apart. You can see some remnants of the tape in this case here. They often have a foam like this as well that serves as sort of a spring that gives you this ability to manage the expansion and contraction of the cells while they charge, discharge, and get larger over their useful life. So yeah, lots of variants of this foam are out there as well. 
Um, sometimes you see the foam is uh, complicated by other materials such as uh, the aerogels mentioned earlier as a uh, uh, thermal runaway risk mitigation. So that being the case, we have covered, I think, the cooling. We've covered the expansion and contraction. We've covered why the bottom cell cooling is good for the cylinders, uh, except for the cylinders that don't have a bottom tab. Um, and from there, we go on to the spreadsheet. So this is a streamlined version of a spreadsheet that I use a lot. Um, it normally has a lot more columns and a lot more rows, um, but I've uh, reduced it in scope here for our discussion today. Uh, before I get too deep into it, I'm going to cover a couple of quick terminologies. Uh, capacity. You hear this term a lot. It's generally uh, a unit in amp hours. So I'm defining the cells at the top half of the spreadsheet here and the amp hour rating of the cell is important for all of the energy and power calculations. So um, again, what this means, if in the case of a five amp hour cell, that means if I draw five amps from this fully charged cell, I can do that for an hour. All right, so that's just kind of a general rule of thumb. So it's current uh, over time for amp hours. Uh, if you take that and again, apply Ohm's law, and multiply that amperage with the nominal voltage, now I know what is the nominal energy, if you will. So you can see that in terms of watt hours here. So volts times amps is watts, and if I include the element of time, it becomes watt hours. Again, power is this instantaneous moment in time that decides what your acceleration performance could be in the discharge it decides what your regen performance would be in the deceleration mode, if you will, or where you're trying to recover kinetic energy from the vehicle. So from there, another general grouping is the module definition. You'll find in this spreadsheet, I've got all of the batteries in question have at least one module. Um, and even in the case of the structural pack with the 4680, it's still electrically grouped as, as a module, even though it's not a separate replaceable device within the pack. So that said, um, not all of the batteries in question have two different module sizes, but where they do in this case here, I've got them clearly identified. And then down further, I declare how many of one type of module I have versus how many of the second type. And then I don't have any of them in this case that have strings of those in parallel, except for the case of the Hummer. So we'll get to that in the beginning here. Let's start with the simple uh, Rivian. I have a five amp hour cell. This is a, uh, a 2170, 21700, depending on how you like to describe it. It is one of the few where we had the luxury of having a data sheet that you could get from the original equipment manufacturer, uh, easily confirmed with what is the part number printed on the side of the cell. So I'm able to get some pretty good information going into that. It's otherwise, um, filled with information in the yellow cells that I've uh, either calculated, uh, inferred from some other reference or gotten from some nefarious anonymous source. So again, accuracy isn't guaranteed in this, but it gives you a great idea of how this works as a system. Now, go to the energy of the cell, to the energy of the module, to the energy of the pack, and you can see in this case here, we've got 141 kilowatt hours. We've got that number represented by what's called the serial and parallel cell grouping. So what we do there is we talk about how many cells are in series and then how many groups there are in series. And by groups, I mean groups of cells in parallel. So we define that in the module. In this case here with the Rivian, there are 72 cells of the 2170 type that are all grouped together as a single cell group. And then there's 12 of those in series to make a module. So each of the modules has 864 cells in it. Then we take those and put them in series and we end up with a pack and we can see that if we see how many modules there are, we can see what the total amount of energy there is in terms of kilowatt hours. Now, one thing that I've, I've avoided in this spreadsheet explanation is the subject of power and a very important topic that I hope to get into in a, a, a subsequent um, discussion that is called C-rate. 
So if I have uh, five amp hours and I have one C, okay, that would mean that I could get five amps out of it, right? If I can get one 2C out of it, I can get 10 amps out of it. And again, there's different durations. I'll touch on that at a later, a later point. But you need to understand the importance between the amp hour rating that can tell you what the instantaneous um, power would be simply by knowing the C rate that is a very deep subject for another time. So that being the case, don't confuse power with energy. We're talking about energy here, and this is always power over time. So again, there will always be some element to it that says hours, and uh, sometimes you might see it expressed in minutes depending on what you're trying to do. So that being the case, there's always a difference between the kilowatt hour rating of a pack and what would be the usable energy. So this is a little bit like your gas gauge in your car. Um, when it's full, there's usually something more than full. You can usually put a few extra gallons in on top of when it says full. And likewise is the case when it's empty. Nobody likes to walk. So there's always usually a couple of gallons at least when it says empty before it's completely empty and you walk. So they've done the same thing in batteries. And that is the difference between this gross energy figure that is function of the, the physics and the parallel and series grouping of cells with a particular capability and the notion of um, the usable energy. And I've expressed that here in terms of this might be what the manufacturer advertises if they advertise it at all. And it might also uh, give you a number that's important to say that in this case here, 95.7% of the gross energy is available to the user. So yeah, these will be somewhat subjective elements. This could mean everything from the simple thing that nobody likes to walk, uh, so you don't ever um, go below empty, if you will, although in most cases you can. You get to uh, zero miles of range, you can go negative in most cases, to your own detriment perhaps, um, and certainly to the batteries dislike. So that being the case, yes, um, this can also be the function that the OEM decides they can change on the fly because there's an over there update that's possible. They can change the amount of usable energy that's available to the user either through some sort of a paid uh, subscription upgrade or in the case of uh, some situations, maybe there's an, a disaster or an emergency where they wanna have uh, more range for the electric vehicle customers they have. So again, that can be managed uh, with a software aspect. Then, you know, lastly, we take the number of series cells and the number of parallel groups, and we put them together in what we call S's and P's. This is a very common uh, terminology. 12S72P is because I've got 72 cells in parallel and 12 groups of those in series. And if I take that pack wide, I know that with nine of those modules, I end up with the same 72 in parallel because I didn't change that, but I now have 108 cells in series, and that gives me what is the ultimate voltage that I can work with at the pack level. So it's quite simple. I take what is the max voltage up here at the cell level and the min voltage at the cell level, and those will vary a little bit depending on technology, and then I just simply multiply it by the number of series cell groups that I have in the array, and I end up with a maximum voltage and a minimum voltage that you can expect to be what would be the physical limits in this case, not the ones that the user has access to. In other words, you may or may not be able to discharge all the way down to 270 volts, um, but something above that is quite normal, and again, that would be a function of how much of that energy is usable to the user. Going across the top here, and I'll wrap this up, there's lots of different shapes and sizes. Um, one of the more interesting ones here is the Hummer. This is one that can dynamically change itself. Um, it is normally a 400 volt system, but it can rearrange itself for 800 volts to make it easier to do DC fast charging. So it just kind of shows you that the voltage range varies quite a lot. And finally, the notion that um, it is simply changing what is the S and P arrangement for the pack. You'll notice that at 800 volts, it's a 192S 3P and at 400 volts, it's a 96S 6P. So again, it can do that dynamically and as a function of whether it has a real 800 volt charger to work with or not. So other ones that stand out here, um, you'll notice the nominal voltage of the 
LFP cell is significantly lower than that of almost all the, all the others. Um, again, that's what we hear about a lot with LFP. It has less energy density. It also has a nominal voltage that's considerably lower. And because of that, you'll need more of them in series to get to the same sort of ultimate voltage operating range that the others all enjoy. So that pretty much rounds up this spreadsheet and how it works. Uh, again, um, I add to this C rates and what the instantaneous currents can be for both short durations of say two seconds or 10 seconds, as well as the continuous performance of what I expect to be able to do uh, from a full to empty uh, without interruption. So again, we'll talk about C rates and power at another time. For today, we've covered how we calculate the energy content of a pack. And we've talked a little bit about how the user always has some uh, subset of that available to them. All right, so to wrap this up, let's talk about how packs are rated. We hear a term a lot, uh, kilowatts. And one thing to keep in mind is that that terminology is often misused or misrepresented. Uh, when you talk about a pack in terms of kilowatt, more often than not, they're referring to kilowatt hours, which is a unit of energy, um, where kilowatts is a unit of power. And we've gone through what the difference is there. So uh, a Tesla pack might be 70, 80, 90, 100 kilowatt hours, and you'll find people who call it 70, 80, 100 kilowatts. So don't let that confuse you. Again, what makes the difference? Um, power is an instantaneous mo moment in time and how much power you can get is a function of both the series array, how much voltage you have as part of that series array, as well as each parallel element of that array, every cell group, how much current can it provide as a cell group. So that current over time is energy um, as long as you take voltage into consideration. So again, Ohm's law is your friend there. With that, um, we covered kind of just the tip of the iceberg here. If there are other things that are interesting to you that you'd like us to uh, look at as a follow on here, please let us know. Give us the comments that we need to guide you further. And we thank you for your time today and uh, we hope to see you back again.